Okay. That's good. And I'm watching you, so if you leave, I, I will know. Well, welcome to our uh, uh, lecture series in this point today, uh, everyone. And today we're going to hear from uh, Mario Fuente. Uh, Mario is an alumni at the uh, University of Naples. Frederico is... Uh, Secondo. Secondo. Uh, and uh, he's uh, also attached to Stanford here, which is where he's doing his PhD. Uh, and he's been working with Janice Fisher and uh, other members of the CRISM team on uh, CRISM data, which is, uh, I'm sure he's going to tell us all about in his talk. Thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, as you uh, can see, uh, yeah, I'm uh, thankful to Stanford for providing my education uh, and these kinds of things. Um, I hold uh, a master's in uh, electrical engineering and statistics. So, in a way, I'm alumni for Stanford, you know, and in progress. Um, so, I'm gonna, this, this talk is a little bit um, um, an exploratory data analysis of planetary hyperspectral data set, but in particular one data set. And it wants to be an engineering overview or an engineering aid to the scientist um, to just look at data sets in a, in a different way. And maybe I will provide um, means and instruments to the, the uh, scientists that work on planetary hyperspectral data set, and in particular CRISM, um, to, to, do their, um, to do their analysis and to do their science in a, you know, with these, maybe. We'll see. So my talk is going to just brush over spectroscopy and mineral identification, then I'm going to talk about the instrument, but very little. Um, and then I'm going to go through several different um, algorithms that um, we need, uh, in the CRISM team, we need to um, perform in order to have usable data. So we all know that every instrument has problems and uh, uh, moods and everything, uh, so we need to uh, prepare the data for the scientist. And uh, this is what I work on. I work on basically providing uh, algorithms up to um, extracting N members and mostly find out what's on the surface as an aid to the, to the scientist. And then I will bore you with a little bit of uh, statistics because that's what I do. Okay, so let's try. First of all, this is imaging spectroscopy. You know that an imaging spectrometer is just a, um, produces uh, for each pixel of an image uh, an, a spectrum. So each pixel is not just one intensity, but it's a vector of values, uh, which is an uh, electromagnetic spectrum. In, in particular, we look at the visible near infrared and going towards the, the thermal up to 3.9 micron, 3.98. So this just probably you all know about it. Um, how do we determine what uh, we look at the surface of Mars and in particular we look at minerals. So we want to discriminate uh, the mineral, identify the minerals on the surface and how do we do it? We look at the spectrum uh, of the, the pixels and we compare with a library of known spectrum, see if they, see if they match. And uh, why can we do that? Because with spectroscopy, uh, we have diagnostic features in the spectrum. So <clears throat> each, each mineral, um, each mineral uh, has specific bands that are uh, due to a particular uh, phenomena, phenomena of absorption. I'm not going to go into it. But the, the, the lesson is that we can discriminate between uh, minerals because each, each mineral is going to have a different behavior, at least when it comes to pure mineral. OK, so CRISM. CRISM is an imaging spectrometer, but um, a push broom spectrometer. So a push broom sp spectrometer images the surface um, by um, by its movement. So it images a slit uh, with a slit 
it images uh, just a line of pixels and it creates the whole image by its movement. So, you know, like we image in a certain instant of time, we image one line and then we, fo we go forward and we image one line and we go forward, we, Im we image another line. At each instant of time, we actually not just uh, imaging one line and only one wavelength, but with certain uh, optical filters, we are actually splitting the light in several wavelengths, actually 438. And so at the same time, we actually um, hitting a, a matrix, we're creating a matrix, which is an image of a CCD, which is collected by um, a CCD detector. So each detector detects light at a certain wavelength in a certain horizontal position or uh, a cross track position. Okay, so what is that I want to do today? What I would like to propose is, is there a way to aid the scientist in, um, in her study of the surface of Mars where I can kind of uh, ease the pain? Meaning, the scientists go to uh, the exercise of looking at a lot of images and closely look at a lot of images, meaning literally going through the pixels and try to find interesting spectra to see, oh, oh, I found this mineral or I found this other mineral. And they have all these nice stories because a certain mineral means a certain evolution in the geology and the history of the planet. So, but of course, we have terabytes of data. And uh, so, you know, it, it would be nice if we could have a pre-screening of the images, some kind of uh, intelligence or processing that can, that could, hopefully, uh, do a little bit of the work for them. So, for example, uh, an algorithm that could say if the image is interesting or not, or if it's just pure atmosphere. We know that, especially, you know, during dust storm, for, for example, the data is not usable because uh, an optical spectrometer cannot, cannot go through the dust, cannot see through the dust. So, basically, that data can be only used to study the dust. <laughs> or the climate. So, but we, we're interested in the surface. So, can we have um, like something uh, that could actually do that, es especially detect uh, certain features in, on the planet, uh, certain spectral features to uh, declare if the image is interesting or not, or even more if we could actually detect some minerals automatically. That's that, you know, I, when, I, when I talk about these things, the scientists are always a little skeptical, but we'll see if, if it works. For now, we, what we have in the team, we have these summary parameters that, these maps that calculate certain spectral features like spectral band depth or spectral slopes that um, are notoriously um, used in spectroscopy to discriminate between minerals. Okay, so first of all, the first, so let's see if we can do that. In order to do that, we need to pre-process the images because the images that we get um, are not perfect for science. They need, they, we have a, a, a long pipeline of processing to, cre to create da data that is usable. Um, I'm not going to go into detail a lot, but we, of course, need to do um, atmospheric removal. We need to do... Um, and it's done with standard techniques that are used in planetary science and especially in, for, optical, uh, for optical spectrometers. Um, and what I want to point out is that a specific technique, once all the pipeline is done and the, the, the expert looks at the image, a, a, a well-known technique that is uh, used to eliminate even further problems and artifact in the image is the ratioing technique. Ratioing technique is used by the scientists to isolate uh, minerals of interest. For example, if we have uh, minerals that are covered by dust or mixed with the dust, sometimes ratioing an interesting spectrum with an, a spectrum of pure dust where you know, um, the dust is generally featureless or we hope is featureless in the uh, uh, short short wavelength infrared 
So by just doing the ratio, we, we eliminate uh, residual atmospheric bands or residual uh, artifacts, and we can get a clean spectrum of, of an interesting mineral. Let's take this into account, because this I haven't yet figured figure out how to do automatically. Um, all right, so first of all, when we, have, when, when we deal with CRISM images, when we download the images from, from the... Uh, from the the website, um, we have we have uh, I over F files. I over F files are uh, radians divided by the cosine of the uh, of the solar um, angle. So we have a kind of a relative reflectance factor. It's not yet the reflectance, but um, but th this uh, image that we get has a certain artifact. The most important artifact is vertical striping. I don't know if you can see, see it in the image, but you will see constant uh, uh, lines of different brightness uh, over, over the whole image. Constant brightness. Maybe there is a one here. There is one here. Um, these images are not very fortunate in that sense, but um, I hope you can see those. Also, there are some residual artifacts from the pipeline processing, which uh, show up as very bright, very bright short segment of vertical line, like these guys. Okay, I'm going to call these lines, which are detected, which are indicated by these arrows, stripes, and I'm calling this little. Um, segment of very bright uh, part of the image, I'm going to call them spikes. Why? Because uh, they actually look in this, when, when we look at the spectrum, we see these, these kinds of things. So we actually see spike noise, spiky noise, uh, almost like speckled noise in the, in the spectrum. So, and I dis discriminate between these two because they are com coming from two different uh, problems. I'm not going to go into that, but let's say that uh, we discriminate between the, those. So how do we eliminate the vertical striping? So we said that vertical striping is um, a phenomenon in which we have a difference in brightness of columns o over a column. And this is constant over the, over the whole image. So how, do, how can we eliminate that? Oh, we have to say that these stripes are indep band independent. So if we have, we have a, an image cube with each channel is an image, the noise in each image or each channel is different. That's, go ahead. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. When I, when I say independent, it means that the line doesn't appear, if he, if he appears in this image, doesn't appear in it's, it's, it's not required that it's a, there appears in the next. It might happen, but it's not. Uh, isn't, they're not correlated. The noise in, in each band is not correlated. So that's why we can actually treat it band by band. So how do we do that? Um, how do we eliminate that noise? What we do, we take each band and we average over the lines. That has the effect of of smoothing or eliminating the surface, uh, the surface information. Why? Because the surface information generally has a spatial frequency that is small, much smaller, uh, generally, than the noise. Also, the noise remains constant because, by definition, it's constant over a column, over over the lines. And then the random noise, which is we assume it as mean zero, also get disappears when we average. So what we get is a line for each band. We stack these lines together, and that's what we get. A matrix or an image that has wavelength on the, on the uh, y-axis and, and cross-track dimension on the x-axis. And you can see that this is a nice atmospheric spectrum because you know, like it goes down here uh, around here and then goes down. Uh, in the almost in the thermal, this is the CO2, and here there's the, C, the other. Where is it? 1.9. Okay. So then, what we do here? The good thing is, 
about this transformation is that the, the striping becomes random noise in this image. So all this, there are little pixels that are speckly and kind of random, randomly uh, of different brightness. So the only thing you need to do is smoothing this image. We need to be careful because the smoothing cannot be just anything. Uh, we need to be careful with the information that we might lose. For example, if the image has a lot of uh, spatial uh, variation in this dimension, we might lose information if we just dis you know, discriminately, indiscriminately do the smoothing. But I'm not going to go into that because in that case we need optimization algorithms that I don't have the time to describe. Okay, so imagine, go ahead. Um, well, wavelet, wavelet, wavelets um, are good for um, eliminating, for denoising in the Gaussian domain. Like the same thing as MNF, uh, the maximum noise fraction, um, does a nice reduction for, for Gaussian noise. The wa wavelets uh, are, uh, were born as an as a alternative to JPEG. That means mostly natural images with, uh, with Gaussian noise, with uh, blurred and Gaussian noise. This, this noise is not random and it's not Gaussian. So, yeah. Well, I have tried, I, I have tried. Um, uh, wavelets are very good for directional uh, to preserve information that, that has structure, like in natural scenes. This um, natural, let's call it, geological surfaces don't necessarily uh, fall into that category. And I've tried wavelets, uh, just simple. I, before developing anything, I tried simple techniques, um, and uh, it didn't give good results. Um, I tried several wavelets, actually. Okay, and the reason I think is because the noise is pseudo-deterministic, so it's mostly deterministic, and, and by knowing what the noise is, we can do a better job than to use a random technique. Okay, so Im let's imagine that we got rid of the, actually, we got rid of the uh, random, um, sorry, of the um, columns, so of the striping, let's see if we can do anything for the spiking. The spikings are just saturated pixels. So if we just define a grid, uh, a grid where we um, ass uh, assign a threshold or a probability of going, of uh, saturating a certain pixel, we can actually filter those out. We define uh, a spike as a single channel saturation. So by defining a threshold, maybe a chain, um, an adaptive threshold, depending on the information in the image, we can filter those out. And this is a detector for the, for the spikes. This little thing here are all spikes. And this image happens, uh, in this image you have even um, a very degraded part, which, which is um, like a bunch of cluster spikes. So we cannot just detect uh, isolated spike, we can also detect clusters. All right, so maybe, maybe I can convince you that uh, the original image has been denoised. Uh, I don't see any more the little green things here, and I don't see any more these lines. So this image was, I, um, this image was, was not very stripey, at least visually. Uh, I should have used a better image to show, but Maybe I can, I can convince you by looking at a spectrum. That's probably the, the, the most important um, result because what we want is actually to have a usable spectrum for analysis, which is the blue spectrum. And we can see that the spikes are, uh, well, the spectrum has improved. And uh, the spiking is a delicate operation because you don't want to remove information from the spectrum. So, you know, like very small spike, maybe we're not dealing with, but 
you know, maybe this is in a delicate spot. Maybe if we smooth more, we remove information there. No, because uh, the smoothing is done, sorry, is done in the spectral domain and it can be targeted to the spatial information of, uh, in the X domain. So if we have resolution like contrast of two pixels uh, in, the, in the spatial domain, we cannot smooth more than two pixels. So, so it doesn't actually... Uh, it's, we, we do, we do a, a process that is sub pixel so it doesn't actually um, impact the resolution in the X domain and in the in the in the space in the um, in the spectral domain we want smoothing so yes it, we remove we, we smooth out in a, in a principal way but we actually remove information but we want to argue that there is a lot of uh, redundancy in the spectrum because of this noise okay so um, can you guys let me know the time, just, oh, okay, good. All right, so once we are done with the denoising, we have an image that uh, is cleaned in the sense that we have probably usable spectra. We still have some problems if we want a complete spectrum in each pixel, in each position between 0 0.3 and uh, 3.9 micrometers. Why? Because CRISM actually has two detectors. One, which often happens in, in, in spectrometers. Uh, we have two detectors. One that goes from one, 0 0.3 to 1, around 1 micrometers, and then it overlaps a little bit with the other detector, uh, call it the L detector, the longer wavelengths between 1 and uh, 3.9. So, how do we join the information together? As you can imagine, the, uh, if you look on the right, uh, sorry, on the left, the, if we take um, pix spectrum of a pixels um, at the longer wavelength, they don't overlap with the same pixels at the shorter wavelengths. And this is for two reasons. One is because the the, the detectors are not, um, oh, uh, they're not aligned uh, spatially. Another one is because the detector have a gain problem, or I, don't, I wouldn't call it problem. This is something that is well known in every, every detector. They have always a difference in albedo between the two detectors. So what do we need to do to, to, to uh, solve the problem? We have... First of all, we georeference to, uh, towards uh, verse, um, we georeference with MOLA altimetry data. So we georeference the images with respect to, ge to geography. So with respect to the spheroid of Mars. So that at least at MOLA resolution, we have the same, we have the same, we have concordance between the two detectors, at least at MOLA resolution. But MOLA resolution is much uh, coarser than, than CRISM. So we still have a difference. Um, I would say between one and three pixels in every direction, sometimes more, at molar resolution. So, if, for example, if we geolink, if we uh, link the two detectors geographically, so they're supposed to have the same position on the grid because the molar resolution is much coarser. We still have a two to three pixels in a, in every in both directions. So what we need to do, we need to register the two images together. And this is a well-known problem in computer vision. We have two images from a stereo camera. For example, the rovers on Mars, they have two eyes. And they see, it, they see a scene in two, with two different perspectives. So, and, and you can do this experiment by just closing one eye, uh, one eye at a time, and you will see the scene in two different ways. So in order to create a, a complete overlap, uh, spectrum, you need to georeference, sorry, you need to register the two images together. And how you do that? By taking one image as uh, your reference and warping the other image to, um, to match the first one. And this is because the, the, uh, the pixel 
we, we assume that the pixel, in, for example, in the right image, in the left image is a distorted version in terms of the, the, its position to, of, the, of the first one. And that's what we do, actually, in this image. I'm not, I'm not showing the result, but uh, we're, using uh, we're using standard technique to co-register the two images. So it was not like new information or interesting enough to show you. So more interesting, more, um, more interesting is what we do in order to make the splicing between the, the, le the left and right, sorry, the short and, and short and long wavelength detectors. Because even if we co-register the two images, that we still have a gain problem. All right, which is here. There you go. All right, so how do we do that? We take a bunch, we, we solve the problem statistically. We take a bunch of samples from an image which is, which, that has been co-registered. So we have, and we stack the, uh, the L detector on top of the S detector. That means that we have a complete spectrum in each pixel between zero, between 0 0.3 and 3.9. But, um, and so we, we assume that at least spatially they are overlapping. I, and I've done a few uh, trials and it seems to work. Uh, the discrepancy is sub-pixel sometimes. So at least spatially they're fine. But we take these samples and then we uh, plot them and we see this still. Maybe a little bit less because we have co-registered spatially. So what we do, we assume that there is uh, a gain or a, um, a difference of albedo between the two detectors. And then we fit uh, smooth functions to each one of these points and we we solve a regression problem to find the, the optimal value of, this of the, the gain and the, um, uh, and the shift. So in, not, in order not to bore you too much, it works. Uh, this is the before and after the cure. OK. Ooh, more, more statistics. OK. Well, then now we have a usable image from 0 0.3 to to 3.9, the, the, the scientists are happy. Well, but what if you instead you want to do something um, with, uh, with statistics? So you want to look at, look at automatic ways of solving the problems that the scientists are actually facing by just looking at pixel by pixel. Well, in order to do that, you have to look at the data and see the way it, the data looks, uh, the data look as, uh, um, an n -dimensional, in n-dimensional space. Let me explain. A spectrum is a vector, practically speaking. It's a fu continuous function, but because it's sampled a certain wavelengths, it is a vector of 438 values. The first value is a, is a lambda 1, which is, which is 0 0.3, and the 438 is a lambda n, which is um, 3.98 or something. So we, we, you can treat each pixel as a, a point in an n-dimensional space, so a 438-dimensional space for the L detector. If you consider the whole thing, it's 535-dimensional space. So you can consider each pixel as a point in this huge dimensional space. If you do that and you try to visualize it, you see a, a cloud of points. Of course, in order to visualize, you have to project this huge space in a lower uh, dimensional space, and uh, we do that by using uh, n-dimensional visualizers. They, too, they take random projections of the data uh, in different, uh, and they rotate this projection, so you can see actually the, the way the data looks like um, in uh, n-dimension. And you can do that because the data is actually intrinsically lower dimensional. Yes, it's true that uh, the, 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 the complete space is 535, but the actual information only lies into a probably 10 dimensional space. So you can actually see something interesting if you do a clever projection into where the information is. OK. Again, you're probably getting bored. So let me describe what the problems in terms of data uh, we have. First of all, outliers. Outliers are points that go crazy somehow. Uh, so that's the statistical definition. 
So <laughs> you have a, 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 a cloud, and then you have some points, I hope you can see them, that don't belong. And in CRISM, we have two kinds of outliers. One, that it's uncorrected atmosphere. For people who work on atmosphere, they will recognize CO2 gases band and water and blah, 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 blah. And also, we have spiking noise still residual after the removal, because you know no, nobody's perfect. Uh, we get some residual. And here, I put the same image as before. So it's, it doesn't really actually look like that, but I just Maybe you didn't remember. Uh, it's much less than that. But just to say that we still have some spiking, which is another outlier. OK. Well, also, we want to find that subspace where th the whole information lies. Well, we know that there is a, a well-known uh, dimensionality reduction technique, which is the principal component analysis. Probably you know about that. Um, and principal components are the, com are the projections um, where the maximum variance of the data lies. That doesn't necessarily say this is where the maximum information is. Because let's imagine that our information is in the structure of the data cloud. So this data cloud, this original data cloud, uh, which we, I sampled two bands, actually three bands from at random present a structure in the sense that you have a, a cluster here and a cluster here. That means that there are two different things going on in this data set, independent from each other. Well, if you perform principal component analysis, this information is destroyed. So in terms of information, we, that's not the right data, that's not the right space. That's not the right projection. And you can see from, if you take, if you take a sphere and you just project it with, with light onto a um, onto uh, um, a screen, the information that points that are on the same uh, line on the sphere, but two different sides of the sphere, they overlap. So that information is lost. So if you, if you are lucky and that information is exactly what you want, well, tough life. So I want something that is not like PCA that, that gives me in, in space some kind of preservation of information. And I found this uh, local linear embedding as, I'm not going to bore you with what it is and all the math. I've just el eliminated all the equations. But the idea is that I want something that locally um, keeps the same structure. The geometry of the data should be locally preserved. I go into a, a, a lower dimension but preserving the local. So if I have a structure that is a cluster, I should be able to preserve that. OK, so how does it work? Um, pretty, very briefly, it works like I have a manifold, which is a nonlinear space. And I calculate neighbors. Um, that means that I calculate points that are closest to the certain point, the current point. So I, I have a big matrix of these distances uh, from each point to another. And then I calculate weights, which are, let's say that I want that I describe this kind of network of points in a certain way, in a in a compact way. And this is basically a linear, uh, this, the a linear um, description that has weights. That just the description is just a matrix with certain weights that represent how close each point is with respect to another point. Well. Then what I do, I take that matrix and I re-represent it in a lower dimensional space. Uh, and basically, that um, amounts at basically unfolding the manifold. And that's what happens. So you can see that the distance between these points, the, the red points, and these, po and, sorry, and these points, the blue points, is completely destroyed. But they're not local. They are local in a space that is linear, but they're not local in the sense of the manifold. They shouldn't be local. And in fact, they're on one side or the other. But the local information is preserved. OK, maybe I've convinced you that that's a nice projection. So well, now that, I, that I'm able to go into where the information is, can I find actual the nice minerals that we're interested in? And we do that with spectral unmixing. We assume that the surface, 
is not pure minerals waiting for us, waiting for us to, to identify them, but it's a, a confused mixtures. And any one of you who has been in the lab knows that mixtures are a tough cookie. Uh, in order to find out what the end members or the element of this, of this mixture is, is, is difficult. So we do, um, I'm gonna present um, a, a couple of ways to do the mixing that have different assumptions. So a mixing is basically finding the prototypes of, for example, a linear combination. Uh, and we assume that each pixel is either a linear combination or a function of these prototypes. So can we find these prototypes? And we hope that these prototypes are going to be the actual end member in a, in a mineral mixture. So the pure minerals. Well, I'm not going to bore you with this because um, I'm just going to say that there is a way that is geometrical to do this and there is a way that is statistical. So we assume that this, uh, because we, we, we know that we have a data cloud and if everything inside the data cloud is a linear combination of something that is on the corner of the data cloud, we want to find those corners. And it makes sense, right? Because if we assume that each pixel is a linear combination, actually a convex, combination. A convex means that the weights are, are uh, sum to one and they are positive. So that means that everything, as a, uh, imagine that you have uh, two points that, that sit on a plane. A linear combination, a convex combination of two points lies in, on the line between these two points. If you, put a, if you have a weight of zero, you have this point. If you have a weight of one, you have this point. Try to visualize this in a high dimensional space. It's the same thing. So everything must lie inside. So if we find these corners, we are in luck. Or we assume that this is a statistical process. We have, uh, we have n members that, that uh, mix statistically. And we basically fit some kind of function to the statistical distribution that we uh, assume. Okay. Go ahead. I agree. Uh, uh, okay, let's uh, let me. The, the short answer is that the curse of dimensionality is not a problem here because the intrinsic dimension of the space is ten. So the high dimensional space is mostly empty, and we have local um, local we have a manifold that is a lower dimensional and if, we, and if we hit that manifold we don't have the problem of the empty space anymore if if we had independent data then we would have the problem of you know the the uniform over a cube for example We don't care about that uh, because inside is we want to find the extreme, the extrema. We want to find the pure mineral inside. There's all mixtures. All the pixels inside are what is the sum of everything that is on the on the sides. So what we are interested in is actually the sides, not what it's inside. So yes, we will actually. We, I'll show you an algorithm that actually tries to get rid of the stuff in the middle because we don't care about it. Okay, so, well, this I showed you already. So uh, if you assume linear combinations, does it work? Then all, everything, should be, um, um, everything should be inside a certain geometrical structure between these corners. And there, is a, there are several ways of doing that. That's why there's several algorithms and def several solutions. I'm not going to go into it. Well, um, I have developed one way of doing this, which uses um, convex uh, optimization and convex geometry. Um, and it assumes non-negative functions. It's basically a matrix factorization of the space. And uh, let's see how it does. So this is a, a projection of the data cloud. These are corners. First thing, these are the corners that I, that I found with the algorithm. Some of the corners, we see the problems right away. They are sensitive to outliers right away. Okay? So, and there are, and I'm not going to go into 
uh, the details of how you can you can make these techniques insensitive to outliers. There are uh, techniques called regularizations, and you can make you can do a better job. But what I was interested in, in a specific case, if I could detect sp specific minerals. So I didn't go into the process of validating all the results and see how sensitive I am with, the, with respect to the outliers. Let's say that I found these three spectra. Um, in these this three spectra, what, what you can, um, this green spectrum I will call background. Um, and these two um, are uh, have bands that can be um, attributed to phyllosilicates, and I will sh and I will show you uh, later if these are the right things. Well, then there is another way I can do this, and I hope I have enough time. Okay, there is another way to do this. Let's try to assume that these end members or these pure minerals combine statistically according to a certain distribution. Well, a, 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 um, a well-known way of uh, dealing with the mixed distribution of mixtures of, of probability distribution is actually um, uh, fitting distri uh, mixture distribution to the data. And why not Gaussian? There is no reason for using Gaussian or something else. Um, but uh, there is well known, uh, there are well known algorithms for this, and uh, they're well, very well studied. So, but we have a problem right away when we try to uh, address techniques that use statistical information. The problem is that the space is too dense. Anybody who has worked on clustering, uh, clustering is a technique that, ooh, what happens? Okay, clustering is a technique that actually takes a data set and try to find structure. So, trying to separate uh, parts of the of the data that actually um, belong kind of together by um, assuming certain distances and minimizing uh, the ratio of the the. Um, the, the minimizing the ratio the we, uh, between clusters versus the within clusters. So we're trying to find well self-contained uh, subclouds. Well, and uh, oh my God! And then we can fit maybe Gaussians to them, and then we can label each cluster, cluster one and cluster two. So, but um, if we have very a very dense uh, space, this is very difficult to do. Cluster algorithms don't work very well. So we need to find a way if we want to really apply a technique like this, and I love statistics, so I want to do that, um, to make the space less uh, uh, less dense. So why don't we subsample the, the, uh, the why don't we subsample the data set? Let's take one every three pixels. Well, this doesn't really work. Uh, it doesn't really work because in, an ima in a hyperspectral image or in any image, the pixels are very correlated with each other. So if you have information in pixel 1, that information is probably going to be very similar to the one in pixel 3, or one pixel down or one pixel left. So there is an, assumptions, an assumption in uh, images or hyperspectral images, the spectrum of adjacent pixels should be similar. Which, which makes sense. Because if you have a homogeneous area with no image contrast, you take, you take one band of, of, a, of a hyperspectral image, and then you see an homogeneous region. In that homogeneous region where there is no contrast, you take the spectrum of the two pixels, you have a pretty good probability that they are very similar, if they are very close together. Well, when you, have, when you go farther away, then it's not true anymore. OK. so. I want to convince you, I don't want to go into this. I'm just, I just want to convince you that if this is true, then the density of pixels, so we, ha we have the data cloud. The data cloud looks like a very dense cloud. But in this cloud, there, are act there is actually structure. There are subclouds that are more dense and subclouds that are less dense. What are the more dense clouds? Are the ones that correspond to purer minerals. 
Why? If I have this region that prob most probably is one, I, I would say land cover or one class. I'm not saying it's a pure mineral, but one class that is homogeneous. Well, the number of pixels that this class has with respect to the boundary, which is actually a mixture, is much higher. So it must be that in homogeneous area, we have a higher density in space. So can we look for that, for those clouds? Yes, by sampling in a principal way. We sample not by just taking pixels at random, but we divide the image in cells, and in each cell, we try to look for this peak of the density. But not in the original space, but in the local embedded space. So the search is, is easier. And that um, probably a little bit uh, answered your question. When we try to do these kind of searches in very high dimensional space, we know that the notion of distance starts to fall apart because of the problems that you uh, described. But if we go into a lower dimensional space with the local embedding, for example, that's not a problem anymore. OK, so we try to find these peaks. And these peaks are going to be purer and with less noise. Why? Because the noise we have seen produces outlier. Outliers, by definition, are not in the peak of a distribution, but they are outside. Go ahead. Yes, yes. So if things are mixed together, then this would break down. No, no, because the mixture is actually here. It breaks down. This breaks down if there are no pure pixels at all. If there is no purity, if there is some pure pixels, or even if there are no pure pixels, but there are um, more, uh, more than one source of mixing. For example, there is a mixing due to the actual ground plus a mixing due to the instrument because we know that the instrument integrates over a certain, uh, a certain um, uh, field of view, right? So we have more than one source of mixing. Well, we can take the purest of that kind of mixing. And if, if that's not a pure mineral, we're out of luck, but no technique so far, by just looking at image data, can actually give you the pure, the super pure. For example, when we have dust mixed with minerals, the dust basically sometimes in this uh, short wave uh, wavelength infrared destroys the band, just removes the contrast. There is no way you can you can get that information back. It just is gone. If that information is there, this algorithm, this peak finding is going to find it. OK, so this is just how the algorithm works, but I'm not, I'm not going to bore you with that. So this is the result of the, of the, um, of the sampling. OK, My, I argue that this sampling creates, shows, at least reveals, the cluster structure of the data. Go ahead. No, no, no problem, no problem. No. I'm not reducing the data. How are you getting more information? The points are not stamped, but what I'm what I'm saying is that the inform okay. The diff it's it's a, it's a definition of diff it's uh, the dimension of the space versus the intrinsic dimension of the data. The dimension of the space is five hundred thirty five. So if you take PCA, if you take the principal component of the data and you look at the eigenvalues which is the usual way that people look at how, what's the actual dimensionality of the data, you actually get 10 to 15. That means that the variation of the data, it's not in 500 dimension, but the rest is all noise. Right, but how does this subsampling get you any nearer? Well, my goal here, I use, the, I use the data dimensionality technique only to ease, to make easier my finding those nearest neighbors, those calculated those distances, because in a high dimensional space, I, those distances don't, have, don't make sense anymore. A nearest neighbor in high dimensional space doesn't, doesn't exist, basically. It falls apart. But what I'm doing, I'm actually just simply taking pixels away. And I argue that I'm taking pixels away that I don't need. Because those pixels are mixtures of mixtures of mixtures. And these clusters are the purer. 
the purest, I, I argue. And, and that should be true if this hypothesis is true. OK, so when I have the subsample data, I want to take advantage of the, this new clustering structure that I found and see. Go ahead. Sure, no problem. With your eyes, where do you see more of the structure? OK, so for example, see this gap? See this gap? See this gap? So, uh, so, sorry, say it again. On the left slide, you would see that if you had a better visualization. No, that's, that's what I'm arguing. That's what I'm arguing. I've tried several different projections. You, you wouldn't because the, because the data is dense, whatever, whatever you put it. You only see these kinds of things. At the, at the sides, you see the structure. But inside, you don't. The, the, the density is too high. At least visually. Of course, if you go inside the data cloud, then you can see whatever structure you want because, you know, like, okay, so, okay, so then what I do, I just fit a bunch of Gaussians. I just fit a bunch of Gaussians to one Gaussian per each cluster. Well, um, I calculate the distribution and the centroid. The centroid is basically a typical, a typical exponent of a certain cluster, so a typical spectrum. The most typical spectrum. But um, in order to find n members, I need to, within this distribution, find some kind of ex extremal points. The centroid, so the, the most typical element of that class, is not representative of an n members because it's still too much in the data cloud. It's still too much inside. If you see these um, uh, the centers here, which I've, I've represented like just a 2D version of the, of the Gaussian, where the two axes are here, and the center is, of course, in the, 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 the centroid is the body center of the, of the data cloud. So basically, it's in exactly in the center where these two lines um, meet. Well, this is not enough outside, like in, in, the, in the boundary of the data cloud for me in order to be, to be called an N member. So what I do, I take uh, spectra that are instead in the tail of the distribution. Not, I don't take a spectrum that is. But because I have removed the outliers, I have removed stuff that's probably not belonging to that distribution, and I take the, the tail, that most probably is not an outlier. It's not too much outside that is harmful. Hopefully. <laughs> Again, this is all hopefully. Um, OK, so these are my n members then. And I take them very, very easily by just um, calculating, taking a, uh, the bunch of spectra where the probability of uh, the, the distribution is greater than a certain value. Or I can just take, take the principal component and take two sigma from the center, for example. That would, that would take me to the, the tail of the distribution. Well, this is what I get, and maybe I should put them together. Uh, so this, this was the first result, and this is the second result. I'm not showing you the results, because this is still a partial result. I'm showing you this, which is the final, the final result. OK, this is actually taken from a paper, uh, uh, a CRISM, uh, student CRISM team member, um, Eldman, she worked on, a on that image that I showed you at, at the, uh, the beginning. And that image had, if I can go back very quickly, that image had uh, phyllosilicate in these per particular locations. And uh, the results are actually in uh, the right, on the right. So, but these spectra are ratioed spectra. She found. The she found uh, a background spectrum ratio, the interesting spectra, uh, to that ratio spectrum. And this is what she got. Well, I did the same. I took my spectra from before and ratioed with this, arguing that these features are features that are either residual atmosphere and, and a, spectroscopy could, a spectroscopist could tell you that these are actually residual atmosphere and, for example, ferric component for, from the dust, 
and that I have no idea what it is. So this is unremarkable from an information point of view. It has features, but those features are not something that, is, that are interesting. So I took the ratio of the blue and the red with respect to the, um, to the green, and that's what I get in both algorithms. This is first algorithm, this is the second algorithm. Well, they look similar to me. So what happens, what are the, the, the cons? Well, we get spurious features. And while we can, an, an expert could just look at that spectrum and see that that feature is harmful and just throw away the spectrum, I cannot just do that because that's what the algorithm gives me. So I need to improve in order to uh, uh, avoid these kinds of things. But the data, is, it's difficult. To, I mean, when you, when you deal with an n-dimensional space, just fo focusing on just one little uh, spot is not very, very easy. But I'm pleased that I can find the diagnostic bands that we are talking about. These two in here. OK. Well, um, so we are dealing with a very with peculiar data from statistical and from uh, geometrical point of view, so we need uh, improved algorithm. If you, advanced algorithm, if we want to do what the scientists do, or at least help them uh, with, automated, uh, with automated algorithms uh, to, 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 for example, screen the images, screen the good images from the bad, the, what, the images that are, that are um, interesting to download and the, the ones that are not interesting to download. Well, I've presented a couple of algorithms that at least promise to do that um, a first approximation, and but a lot of work needs to do, it needs to be done uh, in the future. Thanks. It is completely automated. No human intervention. No. The only intervention is the ratio. I mean, out of uh, the seven centroids that I find, I choose which one is background and which one is not. That's not automated. But I could kind of tell the computer what is um, an unremarkable spectrum and tell it, oh, this is, should be the, the background and divide everything for to that. But other than that, it's all automated. Could I ask one? Sure. Um, how many images have you uh, analyzed with the technique and get a consistent number of N members? What's your view? Well, I'm still in the process of doing a statistical evaluation of that. And this, this study was just see if you can do it. So I am in the process of doing statistical evaluation and validation. Um, I'm actually taking uh, several images from Marth Vallis, kind of know what, what's in, in those images ahead of time, and try to do a train set and a test set and see how it goes. Um, uh, I, I don't have the answer yet, but I'm doing that. There are no more. I'll ask another one. Sure. Okay, the adaptive part uh, looks at the, uh, the information in the spectrum. Um, so sometimes you can have a spike because there is a, a very different, um, a very different spatially, there, is, there are two different spectra. So in, in this point, maybe you are at the bottom of, of a chasma and, and the next pixel you are in the top of the chasma or, or you are on the ridge or something. And that creates uh, two very two very different spectra, and sometimes it can create a spike if there is some noise. So that part should be taken into account. So what I do, I take uh, I take a threshold that basically jumps over those uh, when when you recognize that that uh, um, uh, a spectrum is in in a ridge in in a ridge or in a, a transition. I just uh, um, uh, put it up like I increase I increase it. So I I I, I tell it look, the, the spike should be higher because you can get some spikes because of the transition. So it just jumps like twice as much or three, three times as much. So you're using spatially correlated. Right, right. 
I'm actually extracting edges and looking at where the position of the edge and then jumping over those. 